All right. Well, the season premiere, the new season of Dark Side of the Ring was just this past Thursday night, May the 6th, with the two-hour Brian Pillman episode. And a lot of people were liking it uh, that I saw on the internet this morning. I loved it uh, as a start. I know you're hard to please, Brian, because you're a stickler for historical accuracy. So let's start with what did you think? I think it was one of the best ones they've done. I had a thought about an hour, 10 minutes or so into it that this could be the best one they've done. And I think a lot of that is everyone interviewed was actually a key player in the story. It wasn't like past seasons where all of a sudden, you know, like a Bruce Pritchard or someone or a Scott Hall, someone who... Montreal was a work. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Someone who had no reason to be there and spinning a narrative they were spinning, and they really didn't add much to the story. In this case, every single talking head, and let me commend you, thank you for putting on a nice shirt for once. Well, for doing you know, this. I thought for it's a big 14 episode season or 14 hours. There was the two hour two parter with Brian, but I thought I would dress up. But every talking head I thought was great, and everyone contributed to the story. We could talk about this. I felt like it was really well done for me, although I understand why some may want the Pillman family story after Brian Pillman. For me, I got a little uncomfortable during that. It went on for a little while. I you know, didn't necessarily need to see a reenactment of Brian Pillman Jr.'s stepdad throwing his video game console. So that's the only thing that takes it down from me saying it's the best one they've done. But I thought it was great. And I saw hour one because they leaked hour one the other day on YouTube. So I watched that and I thought it was fantastic. And then I finally watched hour two. I, I think they did a great job with it. And I, I loved it. And I wasn't for once. I'm not even <clears throat> the the party pooper here in that. I wanted the non-wrestling, the family stuff. I thought that's what put it over the top because, and like I said, when we interviewed Evan and Jason, what, a week or two ago, week ago, it, it, a couple of times hearing him talk, I had to walk, I had to stop it and walk off because I felt so sorry for the guy. And it, it just made me, it made him a huge baby face. I hope Good Lord, maybe are they smart enough to do something with this now? Because what a sympathetic guy and a feel-good story. And he's down there being the the partner of a guy who's clearly doesn't have the upside that he does, and he's the one that always gets beat and the varsity blondes and et cetera. But the point I was going to make is this not only captured Brian's wrestling career, chronologically accurate, with the footage clearly identified and the moves that he made and et cetera, but also spent more time on the, the, his personal life and the family story, because it was such a big part of everything that happened. But whereas usually to me, that starts when I've started getting bogged down a little bit, it brought it up even further. This was, and I think in the first season, they, they got talking heads that they got, and I know I'm, I'm in this, but I deserve to be in every one I'm in. But in the first season, they may have got some talking heads that just responded or reacted to a lot of different things because, you know, they were still making contacts and they were still feeling out how to do this show. But I, the last season was, even though the some of the names have gotten less prominent, the stories are as good or better than the big names. So whereas bi biography on A&E is going for the, they're, they're playing the Stones' greatest hits, and they're going for the big names, and they're concentrating primarily on wrestling, except if they do a hit piece on Randy Savage, because they just want the wrestling fans and the viewership. These stories now, especially in the third season, uh, Brian's one of the bigger names, but the the stories they do are, I think they're they're finding that mix that they wanted originally, where if you're a wrestling fan, you probably know the story, but you've never heard the the people involved, including especially the family members, the non-public members, tell it. Uh, but at the now these stories are incidentally about people in wrestling. That if you're not a wrestling fan, you could watch this and and 
and still enjoy it and still be captivated by it and still what a story it was. So they're they're doing that. It's still primarily wrestling fans watching, but if you're a non-fan, I guess the point I'm making is you could watch this and you could get into it. Now, I saw the teaser for Dark Side of Football, and that's not from Evan Husney and Jason Eisner, and they had five minutes at the end of the program to get me hooked on what kind of dark side this was going to be, and it, it doesn't seem like football has as dark of a side as wrestling, or maybe they're just not the same filmmakers. But I love this this show on Brian, and the only there's always a holy shit, you got to be kidding me part. Now Eric Bischoff has decided after 25 years to claim that he was really working with Brian and gave him that release so he could go to work for Vince and come back and he could pay him more money. Hey, can I just jump in real quick and say, I said before, all the talking heads on this, even Bischoff, even though we'll talk about his spin here, everyone did a good job and everyone was a key figure in the story. I thought you did great. I thought Dave Meltzer was great. But the one who stole the show... (laughs) <laughs> a name I had heard for years, but I'd never actually seen him. Kim Wood. Yeah. And he was, boy, can you imagine breaking into the business and that's your coach? Not like football coach anymore, but like kind of a life coach. Yeah. Well, it's, and the, the greatest line ever with it. What do you think of Vince McMahon? What do I think of Vince McMahon? What do you do with a whore? You fuck him. That's what I think of Vince McMahon. Uh, but now remember, I don't know how old Kim Wood is today. He's, probably in his would you think late 60s maybe 70 he was in his 40s back then when he was you know close to brian or maybe not even at that point he still had the same outlook but he wasn't as crotchety um but i think that was that was a real key part of it because kim wood having a background in football and being a coach and he took a liking to brian but because of his peripheral knowledge, and, and he didn't have inside knowledge of the wrestling business, but he knew the hearts were in Calgary, and he he knew what it was on the surface, and he sort of was able to help coach Brian in a way that maybe insiders in the business might ne- have never advised him do this or do that, because they'd have said, well, that's crazy. You'll never fucking, you know, they'll, they'll, nobody will ever book you if you do that. But with Kim Wood, he's looking as an outsider. He's like, how can you get the most attention? And for Brian, with that personality and everything, it it worked. But yeah, he was an important part of that because he was one of the only ones that that Brian was really confiding in. And they mentioned, and this was true, that that was the thing with with Meltzer. Brian knew that he he couldn't he couldn't come out and lie to Dave because. Dave would probably be able to figure it out because he'd talk to Brian so much, or even if he did, it would kind of, it it would fuck something up there. So he just avoided him while he was getting the thing set up because that way he didn't have to lie or whatever. And being out of touch with Dave after all the times he'd been in touch made Dave believe that he was losing his mind. And I, I didn't, I mean, by the time the the whole loose cannon thing, by the time he got to the WWF was already done, all that, I wasn't talking to Brian regularly while he was doing the machinations of getting out of his contract with Bischoff and all that stuff. But so by the time that he got to the WWF, you know, but I, he, I knew it was the same Brian. He was obviously having problems at home, but it was the same Brian and he didn't try to make me think he was crazy. Obviously he was just as, good to work with as he always was because he knew that we had talked a number of times when he was in WCW, when he was one of the blondes, you know, every once in a while after that. And, and as he started into the thing and then he kind of went incommunicado, but I've mentioned that sometimes he would just call out of the blue when he'd been driving from Cincinnati back to Louisville, he'd have to go through Eastern Kentucky, and he would hear some of the radio spots we were doing in Smoky Mountain or whatever. I, you know, I would be on Earl Owens' show in the radio station out of Manchester quite a bit, and he would listen to that. And he'd call me up and just asked about, just at, at random of, oh, what about this guy that did that promo? Or this guy, that, he always was, he'd think about something, and then he would ask someone who knew more about that particular thing and try to figure out a way to work it into whatever he was doing. And you wouldn't even know from what he was asking about, maybe later of what he was going to do with it. But I, 
I knew he wasn't crazy, but I also knew as the, as the, as the time wore on with after his wreck and especially with the family issues, I knew that something was driving him crazy. And we, you know, it, it till close to the end there and, you know, Jr. asking him to be drug tested, et cetera. Nobody really knew the extent of what was going on at home or what would go on there at home. But I mean, you know, once again, every, every part of the show, except, and you kind of, obviously it was disproven pretty much with just the comments that Kim Wood made and that everything else, everybody else said, the only questionable content was Bischoff saying, yeah, he was really working with Brian on that release, which no, that was, that was the talk of the world at the time that, that no, Brian was able to fucking, because why would Brian have told Kim Wood that Bischoff really let him out of the fucking deal and fell for it when Brian and Kim Wood were the ones that were coming up with this shit to begin with. The one person that Kim, that Brian would have been honest with was Kim Wood. So it's, you know, it's Eric trying to not look as dumb as he looked, but they really thought that they could get the real release paper that he was given the news of that into the observer and all of the sheets and get the smart fans talking about it. And it would cement that Brian really had fucked up and he was on the outs with Bischoff. And then whatever the next step of their deal was going to be where Brian would show back up on television in some unplanned way never came about. So to go back to what I was saying earlier, like I said, I thought they did a great job with it. It was really good. I just, I don't know. It was very depressing, obviously, and they tried to end on an uplifting note. But the last, like, 20 minutes, where it's just everything's about post-Brian, I don't know. I mean, you can't sugarcoat it and hide it or anything, but it kind of became a different story in a lot of ways. Well, I I don't know whether it's a different story or a continuation of the story. because And Brian Jr. looks so much like his dad. And... You know, I was worried about him at first, but he didn't grow up anywhere near around the inside of the business. He has, So he has the bloodlines, but he didn't have any of the knowledge of a second-generation wrestler. It wasn't his fault. He was, what, just a few years old when his dad died. So getting into the business, he didn't have the innate... And I've mentioned this before. The first time I worked with him on a show up in Indiana several years ago, he didn't have the innate understanding of timing or ring positioning or give and take in an interview or just any experience at all with being other than somebody who watched wrestling because of just the timing. But he's come along, at least the last times I've seen him in AEW, his positioning is better and he's doing spots. I've thought that he's been the, the most impressive one between him and old Skinny Griff, his partner. For a while there, when he was in MLW, I was here, maybe he was starting to get a big head and be a little bit uh, a star before his time, but I'm thinking that uh, that he settled down on that. So I think that's kind of a continuation of Brian's story. At least it, it was it was something to make people feel good at the end of it because it was that would have been such a downer. I mean, you just wanted to walk out in traffic if you'd have ended it with Melanie. And that's, that's something I said to Evan and Jason, they were very, they showed a lot of restraint. I'm sure everybody told a story uh, that would have made Melanie Pillman look worse than she came off, but they pretty much let her just the way she came off, determine how she came off. And they could have aided it quite easily, but i still think a lot of people are probably out there with pitchforks and torches. Um, but they, they had to bring it up at the end. Thank goodness for Brian's sister who was, you know, is an angel in that whole thing for, for those kids who have at least had some type of, you know, family unit. And, you know, I thought it, it was, it was so sad also when Brian said, you know, about trying to reconnect with Melanie and have a relationship. What am I supposed to do? Hate my mother all my life. You know, that's just, ah. <sighs> But, um, and I mean, you know, uh, anybody who was around Les Thatcher and doing the Brian Pillman memorials and the way that that turned out over the few years that they did them was, you know, 
not a fan of Melanie's or the fact that none of those kids actually ever really benefited off of the fundraising that everybody did to help them. But, uh, you know, I like the way they ended it because at least it gives people hope, you know, but, and, and also there was another thing. They had the pictures of Brian with the, the tracheotomy patch over his throat and the scar. And I just go back to that is the greatest angle I have ever come up with that nobody ever saw. And what could have been done, even if it wasn't us, even if it was somewhere else, that's a, a lost opportunity for a fucking baby face. Brian Pillman had the, one of the most inspirational true stories that you could have told. And they never fucking did it. And then he switched heel and it was immaterial and then it was too late. Well, between 1989 and 1991, 92, who had more start and stops of their push than Brian Pillman? Nobody. Because, and they even said it every time a new booker would come in or management change, he'd have to start over from scratch. But well, and, and, and our, the, the, the throat angle wasn't even cut off by booking change. It was cut off by, you know, fucking Hurd and Barnett agreeing with him that they were going to save it for a rainy day that never came. But I'm, and I'm not even being selfish with, oh, we wanted to have those matches and do that angle and et cetera. I'm just saying that that for any heel, okay, let's say we let, let's save it and let Flair do it. Except they never did it with him either. For any heel to have fucking shot that angle that we did and then the follow-up that they cut off and never did do the, the the pictures, the throat surgeries, the raspy voice, the coming back for redemption. And you could have, at that point, he already, God, did he know? He didn't have any kids yet. Boy, it would have been great if it had been a deal like the junkyard dog instead of not being able to see my daughter because I'm blinded. I'll never be able to speak to my daughter because they've taken my voice away. Holy shit, whatever. But they never did it. And that just drove me out of my mind. God, he could have gotten so much sympathy and it would have, all the focus would have gone on him and he could have taken that and run with it. Hey, I've heard in the past that Pillman dated, or at least dated, the Ultimate Warrior's ex. Was that Melanie? That is Melanie. So she dated the Warrior after the Warrior got divorced. And then she ended up with Brian Pillman. She was in, I... I'm not going to tell you the succession of administrations, but she was the one that was that was dating the Ultimate Warrior before she got with Brian Pillman, and 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 he did not know that because he they said what they said in the show was the truth. He saw her picture in a magazine and just was like Gaga, and I've got to you know I got to find out who this is, and made the effort to find out who it was, and then found out that she'd already had a wrestling connection. All right. Well, a good, a good first episode. Nick Gage next week. No, don't even say that. We're, we're going to skip a week on that. You're not even going to watch it just for the that. story of it. I don't want to see. I don't want to hear his story. I don't want to see his bullshit. Um, I said this to Evan and Jason to their faces when they're doing professional wrestlers. That's one thing. But when they do a guy like this and call him a professional wrestler, it makes the wrestling business look bad. And I know they're doing the dark side of the ring about death and tragedy and blowing up police stations but at least it's professional wrestlers this is a fucking garbage deathmatch guy a bank addicted drug robber and he can go fuck himself and you can look at him with that fucking cross-eyed slope-headed pea brain fucking look on that fucking idiot's face and tell he's a goddamn goof and why anybody would get in the ring with a fucking guy that's obviously got mental issues with taking sharp implements and blunt objects to you is fucking sheer lunacy. So we will not be watching or reviewing that episode next week, but then we'll be back because they do get back into the world of professional wrestling for the rest of the season. And uh, we've got the Korea mega shows coming up. Of course, Bruiser Bedlam, Johnny K-9 will be in the second half of the season. But uh, Dark Side of the Ring, if you want to see me, I'm not over you. By the way, wasn't that a great close-up of me and Harley Quinn? Wasn't that, wasn't she cute? She had gotten her hair did just earlier that day, just for that. And her little slow motion tongue wag, she steals the show every time. 
Uh, but uh, Thursday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern, now that they're one-hour episodes, no. correct? That 9 o'clock? I think 9 o'clock only because I saw the commercial for the dark side of the NFL thing, and that's at 10 o'clock on Thursday. Okay, then dark side of the ring is at 9 o'clock Eastern on Thursday nights. Except for next week when it's dark side of bank addicted drug robbers. And then we'll get back in action the following week. I'm on a few more in this uh, extended season. So we will see what happens. You know what you need? You know what you need if you get in the ring with a bank addicted drug robber, Brian? What's that? You need Omax cryo-freeze. Because one way or another, you're going to be sore afterwards. Folks, Omax cryo-freeze now more than ever, it's critical to take care of yourself and avoid unnecessary trips to the doctor. That's where the sick people are. So you can keep social distance and keep your body healthy and pain-free by rolling on the Omax CryoFreeze CBD Pain Relief Roll-On. It's an all-natural topical pain reliever that ices out the pain with a one-two punch of super cold menthol and hemp CBD. We've been talking about this for I don't know how long. It's just like roll-on deodorant, but you roll it on your back, your neck, your hands, wherever you have the pain, and it works almost instantly and can last up to eight hours. If you've had joint replacements, surgeries, various things, this shit makes you feel better. It really does. And right now, Omax is offering our listeners 20% off a one-month supply of the cryo-freeze or anything else on their site all you got to do is go to omax o-m-a-x omaxhealth.com and enter the code j-c-e omaxhealth.com and enter the code j-c-e you're going to get 20 percent off the cryo freeze or anything site-wide again no messy creams or horrible stinky stuff it'll open up your sinuses it smells like menthol and you can ice out the pain omaxhealth.com enter code jce well do you need omax have you worked your fingers to the bone yet this week brian every week jim on the arcadian vanguard podcast network get information about all shows on twitter at super podcasts or on facebook facebook.com slash arcadian vanguard a few quick notes this week on Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry, the boys talk to Sean Waltman, X-Pac, the 123 Kid, the Lightning Kid, so many nicknames, an interesting career, and of course, began as a fan of championship wrestling from Florida. Hear all about that today at BaldrinPod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention of John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight, then and now, where John and I review Classic episodes of Pro Wrestling Spotlight, his landmark wrestling radio show from 30 years ago. Hear history and the news as it happened. Check out the podcast today at pwspod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And you can also check out the complete original broadcast that we review at patreon.com slash Arezzi. Check that out today, the Pro Wrestling Spotlight Then and Now podcast with John Arezzi. All things are as they were then, except you are there. On the topic of Patreon, want to remind everyone you can access classic episodes of the drive through and the experience today by becoming a patron of Jim Cornette's College of Wrestling Knowledge at patreon.com slash Cornette. For only $5 a month, you get access to the archives from the beginning in 2013. Now, right wait a minute. We, we got to talk about this. Okay. Let's let's just stop down and talk about this. We started this thing low quite some time ago, over a year ago, and there were just dozens of hours of programming that we were putting up on here for $5 a month. But now there are literally hundreds, if not thousands. I think there's got to be thousands by now, right? Of hours, if not many hundreds. <laughs> and it's still just $5 a month? That's right. Just $5 a month. So drive through episodes from the very start in chronological order. Experience episodes from the very start in chronological order. Couple of years worth of each of these programs. $5 a month? Only $5 a month. And actually, Jim, this past weekend, 
The episodes we put up include your two-part interview with Bruce Pritchard, who's a piece of work, and also we have the final episodes of the original version of the drive-thru, which were typically 30 minutes to 45 minutes for VIP subscribers only. So these are the episodes that not many people have heard before. That's good. Well, there weren't many VIPs back then. Once again, patreon.com slash cornet. For $5 a month. For you $5 get all those hundreds of hours of me that some that many people have not heard previously and heretofore. I think you're fucking me. What do you, th- what do you think I am, a whore? You're trying to fuck me? Well, on that topic, you enjoy, Mr. You enjoy fucking middle-aged fat guys from Kentucky, huh? You get a big kick out of fucking us? And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Was that I'm you? Was fucked. that your head I heard there? I'm fucked. You're fucked? I'm fucked. What? You just fucked me. What did I just fuck you? You just enjoy fucking people Will from you Kentucky. you stop saying that? What are you saying? I'm saying you're fucking me. How? Five dollars a month. And then you scream the mothership and hurt my hearing. Go through the archives today at 605pod.com. Available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Of course, many episodes with Mr. Jim Cornette. And we're working yeah. on future episodes right now, including episodes with Mr. Jim Cornette. Stay tuned for more. The 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership.